I'm so pleased to be um, joining the conversation and to be paired with Barna Hesse, whose essay on racialized modernity shares so much with what I'm concerned to work through in my own work. It's also an honor to be in the context of all of the scholars gathered here whose intelligence on this topic of uh, race and deconstruction has been so influential to my own. The piece from which I'm drawing this afternoon approaches the topic of racialized modernity through what I'm calling the intimacies of four continents. And by the intimacies of four continents, I mean to invoke both the relations between Europe, the Americas, Africa, and Asia that were the conditions for modernity in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the foreclosure of those racialized intimacies in the political philosophy of human freedom that founds that modernity. With the proposition racialized intimacies, I intend several, several operations. Firstly, I mean especially the state of adjacency, <coughs> spatial contiguity, proximity, or connection that is one meaning of intimacy. The political, economic, and geo-ontological contiguity that encompass the transportation of enslaved and indentured men and women from Africa and Asia to the Americas and accompanied the rise of bourgeois societies and republican states in Europe and North America. And in the reading of the dialectic of right and slave, lordship and bondage in the narration of European man, I trace the racialization of this intimacy in the processes of its disavowal and displacement that exclude these intimacies of four continents from the development of the human. Like Denise de Silva, Donald Moore, and Barnard, I too observe a disavowal of coeval intimacy between Europe and non-Europe in the spatialization of race, in the definition of the modern secular universality in thinkers like Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and Marx. In my paper, I focus especially on the philosophical turn in which Hegel's important concept of Aufhebung contains or sublates the contradiction between lordship and bondage and the question of freedom within a dialectic internal to Europe, displacing another set of contradictions to a site outside of the West that is spatially and temporally defined as unfree. Secondly, uh, in terms of the concept of intimacy, um, drawing on the important work of Anne Laura Stoller on the range of racialized sexual, affective, and domestic intimacies, both practiced and disavowed within colonialism, from miscegenation to domestic servitude and concubinage, I trace the racializing of the intimacies of four continents in the coeval racial formation of African slaves and Chinese indentured migrants in the early Americas. Intimacy in this sense includes the disciplining of gender and sexuality among workers in the sugar plantation as a racialized site for the microphysics of rule. Thirdly, follow, and this isn't in the paper, but I'm, I'm working to develop this, I'd like to follow William, Raymond Williams' concept, structure of feeling, in which he, which he elaborated as the cultural or aesthetic mediation of the felt sense of a period of a society in ferment or on the threshold of change and to develop the intimacies of four continents as that affect repeatedly forgotten by the modern structure of feeling that desires freedom. With the observation that modern humanism is structured by an economy of affirmation and forgetting within a regime of desiring freedom, I submit that the affirmation of the desire for freedom is so inhabited by the forgetting of coeval racialized intimacy that every desire for freedom cannot but be haunted by its burial by the violence of its forgetting. At the risk of echoing others, race then is the trace of this modern humanist forgetting. I attempt to deploy the intimacies of four continents then as a manifold concept that may account for the racialized, microphysical, discursive, epistemological, and political economic operations of modernity. My paper begins with a discussion of uh, a secret memorandum um, this secret memorandum of 1803 uh, from the British Colonial Office to the chairman of the Court of Directors of the East India Company um, is one in which an, uh, the colonial administration laid the groundwork for the introduction of Chinese indentured laborers into the British West Indies. One of the things about working in the um, public records office um, in, in London where the colonial archive at 
uh, papers are, is that you see that there actually are papers called, titled, Secret Memorandum, or the Secret Minutes, or the Secret Meeting, um, <laughs> as opposed to the public one. Um, and so this, of course, carries a lot of that, that sense of uh, intimacies being disavowed as well. But the memorandum reads, the events which have recently happened at San Domingo, uh, of course, the Haitian Revolution, necessarily awakes all those apprehensions which the establishment of a Negro government in that land gave rise to some years ago, and render it indispensable that every practicable measure of precaution should be adopted to guard the British, British possessions in the West Indies as well against the danger of the spirit of insurrection being excited amongst the Negroes in our colonies. No measure would so effectually tend to provide a security against this danger as that of introducing a free race of cultivators into our islands, who from habits and feelings could be kept distinct from the Negroes, and who from interest would be inseparably attached to the European proprietors. The Chinese people unite the qualities which constitute this double recommendation. By a well-concerted plan, numbers of their countrymen may be led to establish in Trinidad and afterward to spread themselves into our other colonies, etc. It's stunning to find such explicit articulations by British administrators linking Asian racial classification to the modern need to suppress the revolt of African slaves, as well as to expand the modern need to expand production. Captain William Lehman, later reviewing this early emigration plan to Trinidad, wrote that the system for recruiting Chinese contract laborers, this is in 1807, could be even better organized to, quote, render these people really useful and to derive permanent benefit from their industry and labor, unquote. Lehman recommended three improvements. Firstly, the laborers should be more strictly selected in terms of their skills for specific employments. Secondly, some Chinese women must be brought to enable reproduction. Thirdly, the Chinese must be encouraged to settle all in one location as so as to form a distinct community. Another administrator wrote on this, these last points that Chinese immigration, if, quote, followed up with larger importation of women, will be a barrier between us and the Negroes with whom they do not associate and consequently to whom they will always offer a formidable opposition, unquote. So the introduction of the Chinese into the slave plantation economy was described thus in terms of a need for a nominally free labor force to be distinguished racially and socially from both the planters and the slaves, and achieved by inducing reproductive family relations, creating a barrier to slave insurrection. While the labor system of the plantation seemed first to demand male workers, the colonial administration came to view the stability of the Chinese racial group as threatened if it continued to be a homosocial bachelor community. In other words, the racially defined labor formation of the Chinese in the Americas was from the outset a gendered one, and its gendered racial specificity was precisely constituted in relation to colonial whites and enslaved blacks. The heterosexual family structure then among the indentured Chinese was far from natural, but issued from the British colonial need to position the Chinese as a racial barrier between themselves and the slaves. It also constructed Chinese indentureship as free la labor at a historical moment in which the practical meanings of this concept were still emerging. It's ironic that, of course, in the United States on the West Coast, their uh, uh, Chinese are constituted as unfree in relation to citizen labor. Um, so it, it also constructed Chinese indentureship as free labor at this historical moment and in this uh, geopolitical location in which the practical meanings of this concept were still emerging, rep rep thereby representing politically an end to slavery, but reaping the benefits of a coercive labor system that many historians argue greatly resembled slavery itself. Thus, the ambivalent status of freedom in these secret colonial documents is compelling. In my paper, I try to explain the significance of the discourse that cast indentured Chinese as free people in terms of how freedom was being defined in opposition to slavery at the beginning of the 19th century an attempt to link the definitions of freedom emerging out of the European Enlightenment with the societies on the verge of abolishing slavery in which African Chinese, indigenous, and mixed peoples lived and worked together. The paper also traces an, uh, the definition of the human through the figurations of freedom and slavery in the works of Rousseau, Hegel, Marx, and C.L.R. James. And this is where I think Barnard and I um, share some very common 
um, interest in the definition of racialized modernity, and I believe we have a lot to talk about in terms of the type of critique that would um, <coughs> that might result from this observation about uh, the political philosophy of modernity. <coughs> What I do in my paper is to focus on the means through which the modern political and economic spheres become designated as sites for human freedom. And while engaging Rousseau and Hegel, I map a variety of international connections between slavery and migration, republicanism, and empire in the Caribbean as comprising the conditions within which their philosophies emerge. In the relay between Hegel and Marx, I focus especially on this uh, concept of sublation and the contradiction between mastery and bondage within a dialectic of freedom that resolves in the universality of the European state. I propose that there are then two Marxes, one who inherits, well, of course there are more than two, but uh, I just look at two, <laughs> one who inherits and preserves he the Hegelian dialectic, um, teleology and the location of human freedom in Europe, and another taken up by thinkers like Du Bois, Fanon, or James, who acknowledging slavery, colonialism, and the systematic underdevelopment of the third world, provide for a critique of the Eurocentric humanism out of which the Marxist analytic emerges, yet continue to reproduce the dialectical closure of that humanism. Reading James Black Jacobins, I discuss the tensions in Marxist humanism that structure historiographies of revolution like his account of the Haitian Revolution. I try to trace the effects of the Rousseauist, Hegelian, and Marxist notions of freedom and universality within the production of knowledge about African slavery and Asian indentureship in the Americas. This forgetting of the connections between Africans and Asians in the Americas and the affirmation of desire for freedom is crucial to understanding the conditions within which both modern European humanism and racialized capitalism emerged. I suspect that Asian indentureship in the early Americas is what we might call a lost figure due to its ambiguous status with respect to freedom and enslavement, polar terms in the dialectic at the center of modern political philosophy and the narrative of modernity. The lost figure of indentureship represents not merely the isolated absenting of Asians in the making of the modern Americas. Rather, the loss may be the sign of the forgetting of the social violence and forms of domination that included but are not limited to indentureship. What I'd like to suggest is that the forgetting of the figure is also forgetting the way in which the figure is connected and extends back into the slave trade and slave societies that founded the conditions of possibility for indentureship that extend forward into the migrations of contemporary global capitalism, of which Asian contract labor is perhaps one of the first instances. Moreover, the loss of the figure includes not the loss of Asians, but the absenting of the material circumstances and processes of the operative forgetting itself. In a sense, although I draw on historical works and historical materials to map the intimacies of four continents and the ways in which that intimacy is repressed or forgotten, my contribution, uh, I intend it to be epistemological. And I'm trying to explain through an engagement with the philosophical possible reasons for the attenuated focus on Asian peoples in the New World, that is, the politics of our lack of knowledge about these conjunctures. The purpose in observing the elision of Asian actors is not to pursue a single particularist, particularist cultural identity, not to fill in the gap or add on another transoceanic group. It is to be more specific about the economy of affirmation and forgetting that form the conditions for humanism. Recovering hidden or lost histories, which this involves, necessitates a reconception of objects, methods, and fields of study in terms quite different from the focus on the nation state, civil society, and national culture that issue from the racialized modernity of the Enlightenment. <coughs> Yet in doing so, although I will be very interested to hear the way in which Barnard actually uh, changes the, um, the temporality of this racialized modernity, Yet in doing so, we cannot escape the irony that many of the hidden struggles we would wish to uncover, like that of the Haitian Revolution retold by James, are not only carried out in the languages of Western Enlightenment, liberty, equality, reason, progress, and human rights, they must often be translated into the political and juridical spaces of this tradition, so that struggles over the life and death of the human 
often only become legible when evaluated in terms of those spaces author authorized and organized by political philosophical humanism. Our contemporary understanding is so replete with assumptions that freedom is made universal through liberal political en enfranchisement and the globalization of capitalism that it has become difficult to write or imagine alternative knowledges to act on behalf of alternative subjects or communities. And <clears throat> We have not yet exited the regime of desiring freedom. Within this context, it is necessary to act within, but to think beyond this humanist tradition, and all the while to imagine a much more complicated set of intimacies that permit the emergence of the now, in which what is foreclosed as unknowable is forever saturating the what can be known. We're left with the project of narrating, visualizing, mourning, and remembering other humanities within the received genealogy of the human.